Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for coming to this program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm Philippa Strum. I direct the Division of United States Studies here at the Wilson Center. We are the sponsors of this program, along with the Center's Global Health Initiative. I'm going to take just a moment to speak about the Woodrow Wilson Center before I turn the microphone over to today's moderator. As some of you may know, but probably those of you who are watching from home do not know, the Woodrow Wilson Center was established by Congress in 1968 as this nation's living memorial to the only president who earned a PhD. Some of you may know that Woodrow Wilson was a major political scientist before he decided to leave the world of academia for the equally difficult world of politics. He was the president of Princeton University before he became governor of the state of New Jersey and then president of the United States. So what Congress decided to do, instead of building yet another marble structure on the mall, was set up an institute that would bring together the two sides of Wilson's professional life, the scholarly part and the policy-making part. What the center does is we run over 700 programs a year in which policymakers and scholars are brought together to discuss issues of importance to both as well as issues that are of importance to the nation. And we could scarcely have an issue that is more important to more people in this country today than the whole question of medical ethics, particularly those surrounding very difficult end-of-life decisions. And that is what our program today is going to be about. So we are delighted to have both scholars and policymakers on the program. I'm going to leave it to Marie-Therese Connolly to introduce the speakers to you. I will just say about Marie-Therese Connolly that she is a fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center right now. But perhaps more importantly, she is the former coordinator of the Department of Justice's Elder Justice and Nursing Home Initiative. And so I'm going to turn the microphone over to her. MJ? Thanks, Flip, and welcome to you all, both those of you here in the audience and those watching the webcast. And we look forward to a really fascinating discussion here. Um, birth and death are the two universal truths of being human, and we pay a lot of attention to the bookends, and sometimes we pay less attention to the journey in between. And so what we're going to look at today is the ethical decision, or the ethics of the decision making toward the end of life. Um, it is my great honor to introduce um, Dr. Edmund Pellegrino. We're not going to do extensive um, bios. Those of you who are in the audience have l more lengthy bios, but we're going to do abbreviated um, bios here today. And Dr. Pellegrino is first and foremost a physician. Um, he's also a professor emeritus of medicine and medical ethics at Georgetown University Medical Center, serves as the chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics. Um, he was the Professor of Medicine and Medical Ethics and Director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics and the Center for Advanced Study and Ethics at Georgetown University. And he's an author of hundreds of publications and the founding editor of the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy. Dr. Pellegrino. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss this topic, one of the most frequently encountered ethical decisions in medicine, and one which each and every one of you has faced or will face at some time in your lives with members of your family and 
I hope you're realistic enough to appreciate you too may be the subject of some of these decisions. Decisions at the end of life, of course, are very complex and there are very, very many of them. I'm going to focus on only one, the one that I encounter most frequently as a clinician myself and as an ethics consultant at the bedside. And that is the question of when one withholds or withdraws treatment. This question has become a very interesting one over the past two decades. If you go back two, two and a half decades ago, most of the difficulty was seen on the part of families who believed that we physicians were doing too much, that we were putting patients through unnecessary suffering and burdens as a consequence of all of our ministrations and our technology. In the last decade or so, things have been reversed. Now the question has turned out to be, you're not doing enough. And we're finding the conflict being that patients and or families saying, you must do everything to help or save my father or my mother, and so on. To give you some idea of the extent of the problem, unfortunately the slides don't work. If you want something to be simplified, put it on the computer and it simplifies itself out of existence so you don't have to worry anymore about it. And that seems to be the case now. I needn't worry about slides. Uh, but in this study, one study I'll quote to you called the Ethicus Study, uh, which involved some 27 different countries in Europe and 31,000 hospital admissions, of which there were 4,000 deaths. This is the only statistic, so don't worry too much about this in the way it's coming. And the important thing here was that the great majority of the deaths of these patients, 75%, were made by conscious, deliberate choice to withdraw or to withhold life-sustaining treatment. In the United States, the data are somewhat more variable, but are within the same range, roughly between 50 to 75% are made of a conscious decision to withhold or withdraw treatment. And what I'm going to be looking at then is how do we approach making these decisions? What are the issues you need to look at? I want to approach it from the point of view, as I said earlier, that you have or will be facing this decision at some point in your life and with regard to yourself or someone else. And I think there is an orderly way to do it. And that's what I'm going to be doing. My colleagues will talk about more phenomenological dimensions of it at the bedside and uh, various other aspects of the terminology. But I'm going to concentrate on how do you decide whether to withdraw or withhold, because that's the action question that we have to face at some point. Let me start by saying that every ethical decision has an anatomy, and that anatomy has three parts to it. One is a procedure for making the decision. Second, at a deeper level, there is a theory of justification why you decide to do this or that, and so on. And the third, an ultimate source of morality. I will be talking only about the procedure. The reason for that being is that in this group, there will most certainly be different theories of justification, reasons why you would make this or that decision as being an ethically right one for you or for your family. And most Crucial of all, there will be among you a vast difference in ultimate sources of morality. A word or two about those last two, and then we'll go into the procedure. The reason I choose procedure then is that is the one where at least everyone can share a rational, orderly look at how to come to what right decision is the one for you 
based on your justification system. Theory for justification, anybody who's taken a course in ethics will have heard of virtue ethics, will have heard of consequentialist ethics, will have heard of pragmatic ethics, will have heard as deontology, etc., etc., etc. Each of you has someone, and if I could get you at the bedside, as I do when I do my teaching with the house staff, I can dissect it back to where your uh, theory of justification is. But even deeper than that, each of you has some ultimate source, some source of morality which when you're pushed back in a discussion or dialogue or dialectic, you say, I won't judge from this point. This is what I stand on. This is what I am. It may be religious. It may be philosophical. It may be atheistic. It may whatever. But some ultimate source. There is one or there is none. But that will shape your theory of justification at second level and most certainly is underlying how you're going to use the procedure. I can only take that for granted now because I want to emphasize the procedure. What are the questions that need to be asked and how do you go about unraveling those? Ethics, after all, is not a set of visceral sensations arising in the solar plexus and suffusing the brain with knowledge. It is an orderly, rational, critical examination of the rightness and wrongness of human acts. And from that point of view, therefore, I would like to take you through what I think are the key questions out of my own experiences as a physician in dealing with these questions and these issues with my own patients and with other patients. Let's look at the procedure then. The procedure really asks four questions. Who is the decision maker in this case? What criteria do we use to decide to withhold or withdraw? How do we resolve conflict? Because conflict is the name of the game today. This is a pluralistic society and each person has his or her idea about what the right thing to do is. And then how can we prevent conflict? Those four major questions. Now, let's look first at who makes the decision. Most often, when we're doing an ethics consult, we find that the patient has never been consulted or everybody else is telling you what the patient would have wanted. The person who makes the first decision and has the final say is the patient who is capable of making a decision, has the capacity to make a decision. If the patient has the capacity, the patient is the decision maker, with one exception which will come back to shortly. If the patient is not able to make his or her own decision because of their medical condition, being comatose or brain injured, some other reason, then we ask, does the patient have some advance directive? Does she or he or has she or he made a statement either a legal statement and a durable power of attorney for health in which they designate someone to make the decision, or have they made some oral or written statement on what their preferences would be. If that's available, that becomes the official surrogate for the patient and has the same moral and legal power as the patient's own decision. If the patient has never been able to make a decision, that is to say, might have been a victim of some form of mental retardation, is an infant or a child, then we turn to next person who is a morally valid surrogate, not any surrogate, not any member of the family. Members of the family aren't always acting in the best interest of the patient. 
We need someone who, A, knows the values of the patient, can give evidence of what those values are, knows them, can give evidence, and has no conflict of interest. The real world is such that people sometimes are waiting for a death to occur. They would think it, well, perhaps the time has come and dear old dad really doesn't want his pneumonia treated. Uh, they have in mind, of course, the inheritance, etc., etc., etc. The world is a mixed up place and people don't always act from the best motives. Conflict of interest would eliminate them not knowing. Often the person who is closest is not related at all. And the person who is related is from across the country, hasn't seen the patient for five years, and comes and tells you and me that we should do so and so. So the advance directive has transferred to it what we call the autonomy or the autonomous decision-making capacity of the patient, both morally and legally. If a patient has intermittent consciousness and comes into the hospital in a state of uh, respiratory arrest, let's say, and is not able to think clearly at that moment, but recovers after being oxygenated and says, next time this happens, I don't want to be intubated. And you're convinced that that is a decision based on proper capacity, then that decision holds the next time they come in in coma. Now, I've done a quick job here, as outlined on the slides, you don't have that, but basically we're turning to the patient, and if the patient isn't able to, his or her surrogates. However, that's not the whole story. There's another person involved in the decision-making, and that is the physician. The physician is morally and legally responsible as the physician of record, and he or she, therefore, shares responsibility for that decision. There is no talk these days, but it is important to realize the physician also is entitled to autonomy, to respect for his or her personal, moral, and professional integrity. So that there has to be a meeting of the minds there. As a physician, I do not, on ethical matters, submit myself to anything the patient wants. So that leads us to a set of conflicts which we talk about a little bit later. So much, therefore, for the answering of that first question. Is the patient properly constituted intellectually and the physician and both need to agree or decide ethically how to disengage because one cannot impose on the other. I, the physician, can't impose my belief on you. You, as the patient, cannot impose your belief on me. When I say you, me, I'm talking now in general terms. So the morally valid surrogate, keep that in mind, is not the same necessarily as the legally valid surrogate. Some states, and they vary from state to state, I see Professor George Smith from law school, uh, who will correct me if I make this an error, but some states list the surrogates in order, and it's a lexical order, and others do not. But the legally valid is not the same as the morally valid, and from my point of view, it's the morally valid surrogate I want to deal with. So much for that first question. I'm going quickly because the time is limited. And out of courtesy for my colleagues, I don't want to edge into their time. Second question, what criteria would we use to withhold or withdraw when the patient is at end stage of their lives? And usually these are at the end of, these are end of life decisions and not necessarily related to age. So this is for all ages. We have to deal with these questions in children as well. Tomorrow I'll make my regular rounds in the pediatric intensive care unit and they will present a complicated ethical problem involving an infant or a, 
uh, older child, but child without competence, and we will have to try to decide what is in the best interest of that child. Any ethics consultation has one aim, what is in the best interest of the patient, not what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think. It is not a lottery. It's a question of what is the right thing to do and the good thing to do for this patient. Now, to criteria. One certainly is the prognosis. What do you see for the future of this patient? That is from the point of view of the evolution of her or his medical disease. Is it short-lived? Is there opportunity for help, etc., etc., etc.? There's a whole course in clinical medicine. The second one is brain function. And these days, the uh, dominant uh, brain criterion is death and dysfunction of the entire brain, including that, the brain stem. In other words, the higher <clears throat> portions of the brain and the brain stem regulating other functions of the body. Again, there isn't time to go into all of this, but I would say that that criterion is now being re-examined, but it is the dominant one at the present time, and if you have death of the total brain, uh, most people feel they're justified in removing and discontinuing treatment. There are lesser forms of brain dysfunction, so-called higher brain, in which the lower brain is functioning, and there's a debate about that. I do not accept personally uh, higher brain death criteria uh, as a legitimacy for withholding or, or withdrawing the treatment. Then there are the ancillary criteria. For an example, the age of the patient by itself. The age of the patient, I think, should not by itself ever be a criterion for discontinuing or not treating if the patient doesn't have other complicating disorders. In addition, there's the question of quality of life. Everyone says, well, I wouldn't want to live that kind of a life. I wouldn't want to be like that. That's irrelevant, what you would want. The question is, does the patient want to? And only the patient can make a quality of life decision. I'm saying that with some emphasis because there's a great tendency to transpose your values onto the patient, whether you're a physician or the family or anybody else. Only the patient can make that. No one can decide quality of life for another human being. And another ancillary criterion is economics. I know this will infuriate some, but the fact of the matter is that when I'm committed to this patient, when I said to this patient, how can I help you, what can I do for you, and that patient accepted me as their physician, they expected me, A, to be competent, and B, to use my competence in their interest, not in the interest of society, the insurance company, the, uh, any other person or persons. Therefore, Economics enters if the patient has told me, I don't want this treatment because it's too much and it'll destroy my inheritance to my children. That's a right the patient has, a moral right, as well as a legal right. But economics per se, we often get this with children. Well, uh, we're spending a lot of money on this baby and you're not going to have a good quality of life. Not your decision to make. My commitment is to what is the right and good thing for this baby. For those of you who are more socially oriented than I am, you may well disagree, and this would be basis of a good debate, but I'm just outlining the criteria. Finally, and what probably turns out to be the turning and most important of the criteria is futility. That is to say, is the treatment or the intervention that we have in mind are going to initiate or is being carried out, which we might remove, is it effective, these three elements? Will it change the natural history of the disease or relieve some symptom of the patient? B, is it beneficial? And that effectiveness is determined by the doctor. That's a scientific question. Benefit is determined by the family 
or the patient saying, I find that there is a value. I want to live to see my child graduate from college or medical school and so on. That's a value that I would honor. And the relationship of that to the burdens, whether there's a proportionality between the good to be achieved or the value to be achieved for the patient and the expenditure. The expenditure in emotions, in physical pain, and now in economics, again, for the patient and or the family, but not the doctor. So those are the basic principles used to withhold or with Draw. That's the second question. The third question has to do with conflict. Let us say that we have decided that this particular procedure should be removed. And this is what we're encountering today over and over again. Many, many families and or patients saying, I want you to do everything you can do. And I always say, no, I will not promise you that because everything I can do is a long list and that long list contains many things which would not be in your interest and in fact would be damaging and would put you under undue stress and strain. Therefore, I will not do it. And if a patient asks me on my first visit with them, I want you to do this when I get to that position, I will say, no, I won't promise it. What I promise you I will do is I will do everything effective, everything beneficial, and everything that's proportionately effective and beneficial, that is to say, the price to be paid for it, not in dollars, but in pain and suffering and burdens, is satisfactory. Therefore, what we're doing here is saying, now we'll have two different views. Now remember I, what I said about the anatomy of the decision. The deepest belief system is the one that we don't discuss in America but comes up to the surface now. Well, I believe so-and-so. I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I do not want blood. I am a X. So I expect a miracle. I want to wait for a miracle. Why, doctor, do you want to interfere with God's capacity to heal and cure? So on. I don't ridicule that. I simply say that's a very, very deeply held belief, and it needs to be respected in some way, but it's a source of conflict. So we come to the question of conflict, and conflict now in America and on our team care, where we have the nurse, the doctor, the social worker, the public health nurse, we have the clergyman, we have the observer, members of the family all have an idea of what is the right thing to do for this patient, and they may be in conflict. So how do we handle the conflict? Well, <clears throat> I can only list them again because my task here is to lay out the framework. My colleagues will discuss this, I'm sure, in more detail for you. We can try to negotiate. Sometimes you can negotiate, and we do effectively negotiate the difference. Other times, consultation with an ethics committee. Ethics committees are not panaceas. They cannot relieve you or the physician of that moral responsibility. Notice I said at the very beginning, the physician is morally responsible. He or she signed the order. Sign that order and you are this responsible agent. So you have to decide how that conflict is going to be resolved. You can turn to the surrogates, you can try to work with them. Ethics committee, court decisions, no, I think, I hope the lawyers will agree with me. I know the judges do. Don't bring these to court, please. Try to settle them outside if you possibly can, uh, because they're not, in the long run, legal decisions, they're ethical decisions. But in a democratic society, we have to turn to law from time to time to settle a conflict which is otherwise unsettleable. So conflict resolution by a series of different measures. That brings us to the fourth question, what happens 
when I can't resolve the conflict. When you have asked me, the physician, to do something that violates my moral integrity or my professional integrity. You want me to treat your pneumonia with kidney dialysis, it's not indicated, or you want me to do something which I feel is morally reprehensible. And here, if we can't negotiate it, there must be a peaceful, ethically acceptable way of separating that relationship and someone else taking it over. Finally, prevention, and I will stop. The most important thing about prevention is anticipation. Every time I'm presented with one of these cases, it would have been preventable if at the very, very beginning the physician would lay out more clearly what he thinks is going to happen to the best of his or her ability and anticipate the fact that we'll reach a point of futility, of no return. After all, since we're all mortal, we all will be at a point of futility at some time in our lives. And we need to be able to determine that with some degree of logical uh, rectitude. So that question needs to be anticipated. As soon as it becomes evident, I'm speaking now to physicians and to you as patients, to request from your physicians, where are we going with this? How long is this going to go on, et cetera, et cetera. To the best of your ability, remembering we do not have a retrospectoscope where we can look back and say, yeah, that's where we were, and anterior scope so we can look into the future. But we can prognosticate. And so to the best of our abilities, anticipate that there will be a point when we must stop this illness. Remember in those figures from the very beginning, 75% of patients reach that point. And you want to make that decision as rationally as you can, as responsibly as you can, and as much within the framework of your own and the patient's value system as is possible. Remembering, however, that the physician is your agent who may or may not agree always with what it is you want to do. So anticipation. Think about it. Wait until you can evaluate where you are before you make the decision. It doesn't take as much time as people say. I do not have much patience for those who say we didn't have time to do it. This is just as important in the care of the patient as the medication. And if you know how to do it, it doesn't take a long time. It does, however, keep the air clear. It helps the healthcare team who's working with you, I'm speaking to the physician now, to inform them that you think you're coming to this point. Find out what their views are. And remember that every member of the healthcare team is a moral agent and no physician can tell the nurse or X, Y, or Z or the, any other member of the team what they should do. Only what she, the physician, or he will see as the thing that they will do, they're announcing, and then to enter into this course. The decision should be made serially. That means not one shot. Let's go in, do it, that's it, blah, 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 blah. No, it won't work. But a continuing discussion so that people can gradually begin to grasp the truth of the matter that this disease isn't going anywhere. Okay, I think I've used the time. I don't want to cut into my colleague's time. I presume there will be question and answer period. I'll be happy to go into any of this in detail uh, a little bit later. Let me just summarize. What I tried to do is to indicate that the commonest, most frequent ethical issue a moment requiring action is, in the case of end-of-life decision, which is the title of this particular seminar, is the decision to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment. In 75% of the cases in hospitals, that decision is made. You will be involved in this decision. You should know how to approach it. And there are four questions that you want to look at. One, who's the decision maker? 
Two, what are the criteria? Three, what happens when you have conflict? Four, what happens when you can't settle the conflict? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pellegrino. And there will indeed be time for question and answer later on. Um, next, I'd like to introduce my fellow fellow here at the Wilson Center, um, Rafi Cohen Almagor. He holds a chair at the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Hull and is the founder and former director of a think tank on medical ethics at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute and is a senior fellow at that institute. Rafi. Good afternoon. I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Philip Strom and the uh, Division of uh, United States Studies at the Center for uh, the Woodward Center for organizing this panel. I'm uh, very happy to be here and uh, I welcome you here at the center. I'm going to discuss the issue of uh, language and reality and end of life. I call it terminal terminology, meaning the terminology that uh, physicians and other people around the patient's bed are using at the end of life. I'm a, I am a strong believer in phenomenology. I believe that um, the language that we use constructs and deconstructs reality. I believe that uh, we create images, we create uh, history, we create reality by certain languages. And I think that uh, in any uh, profession, the profession utilizes and develops certain keywords. And these keywords are important to our life and are especially important for that particular profession. We can find it, of course, in law. Lawyers are using their own kind of uh, wisdom that uh, other people um, I find uh, very difficult to digest, probe, understand. It's also true for engineers, and it's true also for, for the medical profession. And I think these keywords are important to categorize certain phenomena, to save time and provide a framework for working together. We say a specific word, and we don't have to explain it anymore. When you say a bedroom, you understand what you mean by a bedroom. When you say spring, you understand what we, you have a, a vision of spring. And the same is true for all the other keywords that professionals are using. And today I'm going to focus on some of them at the end of life. My uh, thesis that I would like to uh, detain today is that the medical profession in the past 40, 50 years as technology developed and uh, more responsibility uh, on the doctors is coming vis-a-vis -vis technology, the utilization of technology. Doctors and, and medical profession have utilized certain keywords that I think primarily serve the best interests of the physicians rather than the best interest of the patients. Sometimes, unfortunately, at the expense of the patient's best interest. Now, I'm following the first steps of uh, Dr. Pellegrino, if all the doctors were like Dr. Pellegrino, I think there would be any problem. Unfortunately, this is not the case. And sometimes we encounter some other uh, data and phenomenon. I would begin with the issue of dignity or death with dignity. To have dignity means to look at oneself with self-respect, with some sort of satisfaction. People who feel that they lost a sense of dignity May opt, may opt for death. They will say, well, I'm fed up with life. There's no, life is now no longer meaningful to me. I'd rather die. Now, there's one thing. When this is a voluntary request on part of the patient, it's quite another when someone else asks for another's death. And, of course, we have to highlight and emphasize that when we think about dignity and the patient's dignity, we have to take into consideration what the patient conceives as is or her dignity, not what someone else's, with all due respect to family or other people around the patient's bed, physicians, uh, nurses, social workers, and so on. So it's only the patient, and of course, dignity is a very subjective term. One's dignity is not uh, necessarily similar to another's. So when we are probing and focusing on the issue of dignity, we have to understand what do we mean by dignity, 
We have to emphasize that it's the patient's self-respect and dignity and not any others. Unfortunately, in the field of medical ethics, during the past uh, 40 years, some scholars are using the term dignity to suggest that death is better than, than life because patients lost their dignity. Well, that's why I'm emphasizing that in this discussion we have to probe the patient's sense of dignity, how he or she conceives self-respect. Another one that has been promulgated and brought to light in the past 20, 30 years, especially by people like Peter Singer, who is now head uh, chair of ethics in Princeton, and uh, Dr. Pellegrini mentioned this in brief, is the issue of quality of life. Now, quality of life, of course, has positive connotations, for instance, in rehabilitation, in cosmetic treatments, in psychiatry, in psychology. All of these have to do with the quality of life. We developed all these treatments, all these uh, mechanisms, of course, to enhance the quality of life of the patient. Patients opting to have a cosmetic uh, uh, surgery, to have a psychiatric consultation, to see psychologists and so on. However, when dealing with the end of life issues, ethicists who support euthanasia and mercy killings and so on, they use the term quality of life in a negative sense more often than in a positive one, meaning that they do not seek to improve the patient's life but rather to end it. And again, this is because, there's, so they will claim, the patients lack any quality. There's no life there anymore. He's just, you know, vegetative. He's some, maybe, vegetable and so on. And I'm going to speak a bit about this as well in a minute. So again, the issue of quality of life, and quality of life negates another concept in medical ethics, sanctity of life, that has been promulgated and promoted by um, especially religious uh, scholars, but not only them, also vitalists, people who believe in biology and that nature should take its course and so on, quality of life contrasts with people that believe in sanctity of life. And within this you know, spectrum of quality of life adherence on one hand and sanctity of life adherence on the other hand, there's of course a huge, huge variety here. And some people you know, will say, well, we are not adherent, believe in the quality of life, but still in the same camp, they put themselves in, in the 50% of that camp. And others say, no, we are not there at all. We believe it's not our job. It's not physician's job. It's the job of God, or it's the job of nature to take its course. We are not there. So it's this term, quality of life, often serves to justify termination of life. And I reiterate, it's a subjective concept, meaning that one's quality of life is determined by one's personal life experience. Now, when I began my journey in, of, in the field of medical ethics, and this was back in 1991, um, I realized very soon that it's impossible for me to um, try to discover or to, to uh, analyze all the conditions and illnesses that are existing in reality. It's impossible. So I thought at that time I would take one condition that I think is the most miserable one, the most horrific one, and then if I'll be able to say something meaningful about that condition, ipso facto, I'll be able to say also something about other con conditions that are less serious than that one. And... Uh, I decided at that time that patients in what is called in this country persistent vegetative state are the, the worst off, that it's the worst condition that I can think of. Therefore, I concentrated much of my research in the field of medicine. I concentrated on that, this condition, and I surveyed more than 30 hospitals and research centers in six countries and read all the lit literature that I could lay hands on in English and Hebrew to investigate it, what does it mean persistent vegetative state. Now, it occurred to me when I uh, read, especially media, but not only media, when I spoke with physicians, when I spoke with uh, people around the patient's bed, that the term itself, persistent vegetative state, has some negative connotations. And I rather use more neutral terms that do not entail vegetative. And why is that? I think that from vegetative, many people slide down to vegetables. And I don't think that any human being should be treated as a carrot or potato or kohlrabi or any other vegetables that you have in mind. And therefore, I'm opting in all my research in what I call ethical neutral terms. I'm using the terms for that condition, prolonged unawareness or post-coma unawareness, in short, PCU. I think the term vegetative, although those who coined this, Jenison Plum, 
um, didn't mean that. But during the years, through the years, the term vegetative dehumanizes patients and therefore is offensive to patients and their beloved people. And here again, I refrain from the use of the term family because sometimes it's not the family that has been consulted, but the actual people around the patient's bed. And these are the most significant people for that patient because they, they are there. You know, when it really matters, when it push comes to shoves, they are there to care for the patient. So nobody is a vegetable. We should strive to describe the condition, any condition, any medical condition, without offending patients or their beloved people. We should not strip patients of their human and moral characteristics. Another term that troubled me is terminal. Well, we're all terminal, start with that, yes. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, fortunately for the for, uh, next generations, we're all terminal. We are going to die sometime. I don't think it's the doctor's task um, to put a clock around the patient's head and speak about death. I think the doctor's task is to help patients to live when they want to continue living. That's the doctor's task. And when patients are labeled terminal, doctors send them several simultaneous negative messages. Not only the death is near, but also that the medical staff are giving up. Because if they're terminal, what can you do? The patient's beloved people should begin the mourning period while the patient is still alive. When you use this you know, term terminal, that you convey a very clear message to the, to the families and beloved people. And I think a difference exists between discussions among medical staff and discussions that involve the patients and the beloved people, surely. But even if medical staff restrain themselves of using the term terminal only when they have their own rounds, when there's no patients, there are no families around, only between them themselves, then the patient begs, to what extent are going to invest in a patient that, that is tech terminal when there are patients next to that patient that are not tech terminal? I mean, does it work on your psyche as a physician or not? Now, Dr. Pellegrini is more qualified than me to speak about these issues. I was never uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to, to take this responsibility, so I don't know. But I can guess that when you tag a patient as terminal, then it means we should give up. And sometimes we'll then consider the issue of futility, which is another term that I really, really dislike. Futility means any effort to provide a benefit to a patient that is highly likely to fail and whose very exceptions cannot be systematically produced. First, a treatment that does not produce positive effects is called futile. Second, it is futile, so it is argued, to provide a radical treatment whose side effects outweigh the good emerging from that treatment. And third, it is futile to treat a disease when the patient is suffering from another life-threatening disease. So these are the common usages, I would say, of the term futility. Concerns, however, um, especially in this country, are about costs. How much does it pay us to keep a patient alive and prolong treatment, especially when the technology is so dear and the costs are rising up. And then they often underlie the appeals to futility in the clinical setting and public policy discussions. There's a wonderful, wonderful film that I advise any medical professional to, sh to see and maybe to show in classes called Hospital uh, Near Death by uh, uh, Frederick Wiseman. And he went to uh, Hospital Mount Sinai, I think it was, and he actually documented what was in the hospital. And he, of course, he went to some of the most troubling um, uh, departments in the hospital. And you can actually see, although the doctors are aware of the presence of the family, of the, of the, of the camera, you can see them having discussions with the family and speaking about futility as a pretext for uh, discontinuation of treatment. Now, this is really disconcerting and something that we have to, to ponder and do more research. But I would say that the term itself is a very troubling term. In public policy, the concept of utility can sanction restrictions in the allocation of healthcare resources. The problem is that physicians disagree about the type of clinical evidence necessary to justify futility claim. You know, some claim it's futile, some others do not claim it's futile. What is required is a fair process approach for determining and subsequently holding or withdrawing what is felt to be a futile care. 
And here I come to another term that is problematic. Double effect. Well, there are two basic propositions with uh, uh, double effect. One is the doctor's motivation is to allevi alleviate suffering. And the second is that the treatment must be proportional to the illness. So here we see that the motivation of the doctor, yes, it's, it's not, the motivation is not to kill the patient, but to alleviate pain. The motivation of the doctor is very, very important. And then proportions are difficult to ascertain sometimes. Now, if, how can you at a certain motivation? You can ask the doctor, but then the question begs to what extent the doctor is revealing of his, his or her motivations. The rule takes hold in the absence of flow. In many countries, we don't have physician assisted suicide, we don't have mercy killing, we don't have euthanasia. What we have is withholding or withdrawing of life. And uh, it may not be a necessary means to adequate pain relief, double effect, because informed consent, the degree of suffering, and the absence of less harmful alternatives may suffice at the expense of using the issue or the term double effect. Many doctors are using the double effect as a pretext for withholding treatment. They would say, well, we didn't actually mean to kill the patient, but we provided so much doses of morphine that the patient died. We only wanted just to alleviate pain. Now, in the gray area, when you don't have law, that's what you find in many countries. And this is troubling because I believe that these issues should not be a gray area in which only the gifted few or the scholars can enter, but, you know, first and foremost for the patients. They should understand what's going on around the bed. And from double effect, the new uh, terminology that's been utilized in the past few years is palliative sedation. Now, of course, terminal sedation, when you sedate a person who is, who is really sick, you know, his, his death is nearing, and it's, usually speaking, uh, it's, these are cancer patients. Because they're suffering so much and there's no disease that creates so much suffering and pain as cancer, Oftentimes what happens is that these patients have been sedated and this sedation might lead to death. And now physicians and scholars are using the term terminal sedations. Terminal sedation does not require the patient's consent. It's something that is up to the doctor. Doctors can decide that they're going to sedate the patient until the point he or she wouldn't wake up. Of course, in such circumstances, the fear of abuse is great. Experts told me that terminal sedation happens frequently in ICUs. Physician conceives the practice as the middle approach between euthanasia and withholding treatment. It is estimated that 8% of all death cases in Belgium in 2001 were cases of terminal sedation. We are talking about 4,500 cases in Flanders alone. That's part of, of Belgium. Now, of course, in all these patients, again, you don't need to ask for the patient's uh, will or desire. You just do that. There's no knowledge about consent, whether it was sought or given. There's no data about it. And at present, the Dutch and Belgian physicians do not have clear directive on this, which also opens the gate for abuse. There's no legal regulation, no public or professional scrutiny to examine to what extent the procedure is careful. And there is no knowledge where the consultation was provided. These situations call for a change. There should be clear guidelines when it is appropriate, if at all, to resort to this practice. And I hope that the, the President Committee is, is doing something, some work on this expanding issue of palliative sedation, something that is increasing throughout the world, not only in Belgium and, and, and Netherlands, but throughout the world, palliative sedation is now increasing. It's on the increase in many countries. And I'll come to the last uh, term that bugs me, which is brain death. Brain death, when should life support be withdrawn for the benefit of the patient? That was one question that was asked when uh, the situation called brain death was coined and, and been um, promoted. The second issue was that came to mind, when should life support be drawn for the benefit of society? The third, when is a patient ready to be cremated or buried? And the fourth, which was important one, when it is permissible to remove organs from a patient for transplantation. There is a significant disparity between the standard tests used to make the diagnosis of brain death and the criterion these tests are purported to feel, fulfill between countries and also within a country. In the United States, there are many understandings of what does it mean brain death. What we need to do, I think, is to insist on whole 
brain death. Dr. Pellegrini spoke about higher functions, lower function of the brain. What we need to do if we are talking about a patient that is a candidate for harvest um, um, taken from him or her, we, what physician need to insist, what the medical profession need to insist is a, a, the criteria of whole brain death, meaning the entire brain is dead, not only parts of it, because now there's discussion, say, in some countries, Belgium, Netherlands, where the patients in prolonged unawareness, what they call the PVS, should be taking organs from. So there's, you know, slippery slope around that we need to stop. So we have to insist on whole brain death and not a short of this. I come to the conclusions. What are the conclusions from this discussion? I think there's a need to introduce more ethics into medical school curriculum. And I did a little survey of uh, to what extent ethics has been um, taught in medical schools around the world, and it's very, very little. Georgetown is, is more exceptional because of Dr. Pellegrino, but in many uh, countries, in many hospitals, you'll find very little. We're talking about sometimes you know, two or three courses in the entire um, uh, scholarship of becoming a doctor, meaning that if you don't have ethics, you're oblivion to these issues. It doesn't even come to your mind. You're not aware that you're taking unethical standards and practices and decisions making and so on. So we need to introduce more ethics into the medical school curriculum. That's very, very important. We need to invest more time talking with patients and the beloved people because time is a very scarce commodity. And often speaking, uh, medical staff do not have the time or the patient to uh, invest with, patient, with, with the patients. You know, now that there is a law in Netherlands of euthanasia that is officially since 2002, the Dutch doctors complain that they have to invest more time sitting with the patient and explain to them why why euthanasia and not some other alternative. We need to equip them with um, knowledge of how time investing is important for the patients. We have to clean the language and clarify it sincerely. We need to elaborate explanation instead of concise, obscure, or unethical terms. You, you, you notice that all the terms that I picked here, they're all very short. You know, they fall like an axe on your head. And, takes your time to understand what's going on and it's finished. We need to improve doctor-patient's communication and time, of course, here comes to these figures as well. And we need to clear the law to provide a substantive law instead of gray areas in which only the designated few can enter. Thank you very much. Um, these two presentations uh, remind me of a saying that my 86-year-old father says, which is that uh, life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. So, um, as Flip said, the, at the core of the Wilson Center's mission is the application of theory to practice, the uh, bringing together of the worlds of ideas on the one hand and policy and practice on the other. And our next presentation is going to be by folks who are practicing these or living the practice of these issues every day. Um, Dr. At lunch, Dr. Pellegrino said that 40 years ago when he was at Bellevue Hospital, he was doing house calls. And then um, Dr. DeYoung, who's one of our next speakers, said there were 40 years of wilderness. And now again, there's a flourishing house call practice in some parts of medicine. And we're going to hear about that. Um, in this part of the presentation, we invite your, um, your questions. It's going to be interactive, I think, and they're going to uh, present some case studies. We'd like to hear from you. And, uh, and then we'll take questions for the whole panel as well, and so we are going to open it up. Um, we have a microphone, and we ask you to speak into the mic and to introduce yourself before you speak. So to introduce our final two speakers, we have um, Dr. Eric DeYoung, who's the Director of Geriatrics at the Washington Hospital Center. He's responsible for that hospital's medical house call program, um, which he and a colleague developed. And his primary interest in, is in creating health care services that help elders live out their life at home with compassion and dignity. Um, with him is Jennifer Crawley, who's a social worker. She's a senior social worker at the Washington Hospital Center Medical House Call Program and provides case management services to some of the District of Columbia's frailest elders um, and is a member of the D.C.'s Office on Aging, Adult Abuse Prevention and the District's City Council's Long-Term Care Task Force. I'm going to hand it over to them. They're going to speak from the podium, and I'm going to try my best to run the slides although you may want to cue them up yourself, yeah. if you actually want them. <laughs> uh, 
Thank, thanks, MT. It's an honor to be here at the Wilson Center. Um, I titled this talk with Jenna, as we talked about it, Walk the Line. And hopefully the, the reason that title is, is applied will become clear as we go through. But it, just in essence, it's because we feel like this, um, as we take care of patients here in Washington, D.C., that this is often a journey. And we're walking sometimes a fine line, sometimes a wide path, but it always feels like we're walking along a line with our patients and their families. Um, and that's the, the kind of spirit in which we're going to speak today. Um, we can go to the first slide. So I, we have three goals today. One is just to kind of describe the often uh, messy reality of end-of-life care. I thought Dr. Pellegrino did a beautiful job of laying out kind of the rational procedure of uh, a pr an approach to this end-of-life decision-making. And then uh, Rafi did a, actually a very cogent analysis of a lot of the medical lingo that gets in the way of doing a, a good job sometimes. Um, and so our, our, our job here is different. We're going to talk to you about the irrational, the messy, and the chaotic part of this. Um, and how we kind of navigate through that. Because despite the procedures that are in place to make good decisions and even trying our best to communicate and use the uh, more kind of human language, we still find it to be a largely irrational, emotional journey, both for the clinicians, the patients, and their loved ones and family. Um, so that kind of gets to my second point, is sometimes I feel like the ethics, which I have to tell you I learned um, 13 years ago, my ethic, medical ethics course was from Dr. Pellegrino, and I was a fellow at Georgetown. And I'm, I've gone out into the world for the last 13 years as a geriatrician and feel all those echoes in my mind of that course. But sometimes I feel like the sometimes the ethical theories and my, my um, in-the-trenches reality sometimes collide. And we, we want to kind of flesh that out a little bit. And finally, we want to offer uh, some tools for both clinicians and families as they kind of walk this line. Next slide. So Jenna and I do daily field work. We're, uh, I'm a geriatrician. I have been for 13 years now. And we have a team, a, house, a medical house call team, that goes out into D.C., mostly on the east side of Rock Creek Park, and cares for very sick elders, um, kind of folks who, I, who tend, either not intentionally we, we, don't, we don't find these folks, but they tend to be in their last from zero to five years of life. So this is kind of the last few years. It's not the last few days. It's often the last few years of their life, and we know them over that whole time. We commit to them when they come into our program that we will be with them until the day they die. Our patients are about, so far we've enrolled about 1,800 elders in Washington, D.C. Um, Three, they, they often have anywhere from three to at least ten chronic illnesses. So these are long-term illnesses that they've been struggling with for years, often up to three, three to ten of them. The average age is 82, and the range is 50 to 108. The 108-year-old was just featured in the post. Mayor Fenty went and visited her um, as she just celebrated her 108th birthday last month in January, and she's one of our feistier, kind of more together patients, um, still going strong. Um, they mostly are low-income African-American patients um, for whom, from whom I've learned a great deal about kind of the whole issue of values and, and uh, kind of cultural differences and how people perceive the language and perceive the value of life or w what kind of medical care they're getting. And as I mentioned, they're often in the last years of life. <clears throat> Next slide. So here are kind of the big... Um, uh, kind of words that um, I learned and kind of I think Dr. Pellegrino talked about a little bit as well as um, some others that Rafi talked about. But basically these are the ethical principles that are the large categories. Beneficence is to do good, to do what's in the best interest of the patients. Non-maleficence is to not do harm, and part of the Hippocratic Oath and the oath I took when I left medical school is to do no harm. Um, autonomy of the patient, but also I, I think the autonomy of the physician and how they make decisions is important. Social justice, fut futility, whatever that means, and advanced directives. And I'm, I'm here to say that I admire and respect all of these words, but I, I often struggle with kind of their um, kind of uh, application in our, in our practice. So the next slide. So I think these principles are hard to apply. Not impossible, but they often, um, and we don't sacrifice them, but they often aren't the first things that come up. 
And as, as Rafi was going through his, his slide with the double effect and the futility and the vegetative state, I have to say, I, I, in the last nine years, I can, uh, I, I, I almost, it's never, those issues were almost never the issues that I came up against. The issues were much more irrational and emotional. And partly because we're taking care of people at home, we may not get into the ICU kind of decision making about brain death. But, um, our words are quite a bit different. Our, what, what happens to us is we found ourselves kind of bobbing, you know, maybe with some oars where we try to row in the right direction. I'm on a sea of strong emotions of families and patients, um, as, as well as the clinician's feelings. Um, doing good or doing harm uh, strike me as often very subjective. Um, what's, what a patient and family perceive as good in one case, another patient and family might see as doing harm. So you have to constantly adjust. What is good for one person is maybe not perceived as such by another. Um, this is one we, we struggle with every day is can a demented person, a person with cognitive impairment, maintain autonomy? How do you do that? When they can understand some things, they can tell you what they want for lunch, but they, they don't know who their daughter is. You know, how do you, how do you help a demented person maintain autonomy? How do you apply social justice to one patient? Um, not a patient we're going to present today, but a patient of mine who was in the ICU in the hospital for months, then went, went to a nursing facility on a breathing machine for eight months before he died, um, costing a you know, million dollars or so or more to the society. How do you, as you're in that um, kind of relationship with the patient and their family, how do you apply social justice to a patient? Um, I can't say that we, do, we, we, we have found a way to do that or are, are interested in, in doing that. And, and, and futility um, defies clinical judgment. I mean, what, what we are notoriously bad, doctors are, at predicting whether something's going to work or not or whether someone's going to die or not. There's a huge body of literature that, that they asked all these super expert doctors, what do you think this person's likelihood of living six months is? And they gave these examples, one of which um, was um, multi-organ system failure patients in an ICU, and the doctor said, these folks have a less than 10% chance of living six months. And over 40% of them were alive at six months. Whereas the ones who, uh, these are congestive heart failure patients, a different group, those who died within three days, the doctors have said 58% of these folks we think will live at least a year. So, so it, it often is not at all clear when someone is dying. So futility, I find, often defies clinical judgment. So given these uh, kind of difficulties, what, what, what do we do? So our ethical world, next slide, our ethical world is one of deep uncertainty about what is going to happen next, the inability to anticipate what is going to happen next by the doctor and for the patient. This for me is the most powerful force in my daily practice, this uncertainty and inability to anticipate what is going to happen next. Um, and then it, it leads to some of our, our recommendations at the end, I think. The strong emotions that the, the clinicians feel, we sometimes find ourselves trying to rein in some people on our team when they have strong emotions about what's being done. We have geriatricians, nurse practitioners, social workers like Jenna and one of our others, Sari, is in the audience, um, office staff, um, and then we involve a lot of other staff around the community, but that's our, co our core staff. And they have a wide range of values. Um, but patients and families have a wide range of values. Again, what, what does this patient and family really care about what matters to them? But I have to, you know, the next house I visit, <laughs> there's a whole different set of values in the next house. And then you have to adapt and adjust to that, to that set. Um, so that's, that's a, a daily work. That's again walking, you know, that's a different line that we walk. And so finally, moral hazard comes up. And this is why, again, I think advanced directives are, I think, are over, uh, hyped because um, when people get closer to a terminal, a terminal or seriously ill situation or a highly sick situation, all of a sudden they change their mind. And then we're willing to go through a lot more in order to avoid dying than they were in, in, in anticipation when they wrote that advance directive five years earlier. So there's a moral hazard in which people are much more willing to accept pain, suffering, expensive care. Um, because they're in a much more stressful crisis mode. So ultimately, and this kind of gives away our punchline, but we then find that we have to rely almost wholly on trust 
an alliance with the patient and their loved ones. And that that's, that's the single biggest vehicle for, for kind of guide, guiding us through this journey. The trust and alliance, because that, that in some ways is the only bullet, uh, <laughs> excuse my use of that word, that helps us get, 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 get through this process. So advanced directives, next slide. There are a couple flawed assumptions about advanced directives. One is, and this, there's some fascinating literature about this that's qualitative that says that peop, the assumption that's flawed is that people think about their end of life care. And there's a great study by Joe Carice, which is here, and there's a, the, the literature is also referenced at the end of the talk, where he talks about, he did a qualitative study of 20 house call patients in Baltimore, homebound elders, very sick in the last years of life, and he asked them uh, their plans for the future. And what was profoundly di different is that they planned for their death, but they didn't plan for how they were going to get to their death. They, they picked out their plots, they had their burial plots, they knew their cemetery, they knew they were going to be buried. They were quite ready to have the death occur in a nice organized fashion, but n that was 19 out of 20 had that. Um, a similar proportion in the opposite direction, I think 18 out of 20, had no interest in really talking about advanced directives, DNR status, code status, feeding tubes, dialysis. That wasn't something that they really, the most common response was, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So I think the construct of advanced directives is um, seriously flawed because it doesn't recognize the fact that people often don't want to think about those issues. And when they're asked to, you know, at the hospital when they come in to, to give their advanced directives, um, they check a box, but they haven't really thought it through in any detail. Um, the second is that written living wills anticipate clinical reality. That's a flawed assumption. Uh, written living wills cannot anticipate the clinical reality because they're often written years before the situation arises. The patient changes, their physical condition changes. The this, this specific clinical decision that the doctor and the patient face is almost impossible to anticipate in a written living will. Um, and therefore I think, you know, what do I want in this situation? You have to have all these different kind of, uh, kind of logarithms to set up, I think is often not helpful because it's hard to apply. So um, this other article I'm, I'm referencing here by Perkins uh, references Albert Camus about the false promise of advanced directives and that life is actually unpredictable, illogical, and often absurd, but certainly, and these are my words, not controllable in advance. And so I think the idea of written advanced directors to try to control what's going to happen to you as you cross that bridge, which may look very different than what you wrote down on paper, I think is very misguided. Next slide. So this is a little bit from uh, one of a, a mentors of mine from the geriatrics program up in Baltimore, uh, Dr. Fanukin, who talks uh, about, he wrote a, a, a great article, I thought, about how gravely ill becomes dying. And there's something quite mysterious you can be gravely ill, serious ill, but you're not dying. But how, how does that transition occur? And he said the reason it's so hard for doctors and patients is that two, two main things. One is there's a deep desire not to be dead. And that, that gets into the issue of moral hazard, that all of a sudden as you're closer to the reality, that, that desire intensifies often. And medicine, <laughs> to, to bookend that, has a great inability to predict the future and to, and to predict whether or not you're going to die. So there's, there's a deep desire not to be dead, and there's a lot of uncertainty about whether you're actually going to get there. So gravely ill to dying happens in that gray area. And I guess I would, I would say another <laughs> kind of irrational gray area part is, is that transition. And that's, what we, that's, that's where we live, actually, though, is in our practice. So uh, this is a great quote also from Dr. Fanukin. The appearance of the bull changes when you enter the ring. I don't, I don't, uh, hopefully that flows from what I've just talked about. But that, but that y when you're in the ring, all of a sudden things look different. And that your decisions at that time are going to be often much different than what you anticipated or wrote down or had some legal piece of paper you know, two years ago, say. So in, in summary of the first section, then I'm going to turn over to Jenna to start our first case, is um, written directives I have uniformly found to be rarely helpful. 
because I don't find they anticipate the clinical situation, and they may give me some sense of what the patient wanted, but if the patient becomes incapacitated, mentally incapacitated or delirious when they're in the hospital, then the, the, the decision maker, the power of attorney, steps in and says, well, that's not exactly the situation that their written living will said, so now I'm making the decision. So I'll, then you have to kind of deal with maybe a potential conflict between the, the, the power of attorney because the situation isn't quite what the patient wrote down about. So we're going to go through two cases, and we really would like you to ask questions as we go through. Um, we don't have an exact time frame on our talk because we're open to question and answers as we go through this, as well as the other panelists. And I'm going to let Jenna uh, describe our first case. Hi. Do you want this left first? Yes, please. Hi. I'm going to look at um, a case mostly from the psychosocial perspective. Um, being a social worker, that's what I specialize in. I tend to practice from a family-centered standpoint um, because you can't sort of silo the patient out from the family. And when I refer to family, I'm very cognizant of what Rathi had said, is that family encompasses loved ones, who is important to this person, who's the primary caregiver, um, and those people who uh, share in this person's life. So this first case is of Miss B. And this is actually a case that I'm in the throes of currently, and so there's no tidy wrap up at the end as to sort of how this all plays out. Um, but she's an 81-year-old African-American female, she is, has end-stage renal disease, is, um, has been on dialysis for 18 years, um, which is a long time, long time. Um, she has diabetes, which is controlled uh, by diet at this point. She is very hard of hearing, which makes uh, communication quite challenging. Uh, she oftentimes, you have to shout in order for her to hear you. Um, so she either hears a few words that you're trying to communicate or she gets upset because she says, why are you yelling at me? So, you know, there's a real um, challenge. <laughs> uh, she has a history of depression. And so her affect is oftentimes very flat. She's difficult to engage. Um, and she appears withdrawn most of the time. Um, but sometimes there's sort of a flicker of light and she can, she can smile and, and she is more um, interactive. And so, in her diagnoses, there's a question, is it dementia or is it pseudo-dementia as a result of her depression? And where is her mental capacity um, on this spectrum? And, and it's very hard to, to figure that out because the communication is so challenging. Um, and she really defers a lot of decisions and, um, and reports. If I go in for a home visit, I'll ask for history, how things have been going over the past month and such. And she'll defer to either her aide or her daughter. And so, you know, it sort of leaves me in the middle trying to piece things together and try to figure out where she stands on things. Um, and then finally, she um, is fairly dependent for her activities of daily living, which include bathing and dressing, toileting, etc., as well as her instrumental activities of daily living, such as um, meal prep, housekeeping, uh, money management, using the phone. Next slide, please. So this is where um, this case sort of gets interesting. Um, her daughter became her primary caregiver um, following her beloved son's death about a year and a half ago. And her son really celebrated who she was. Um, he was very respectful of her. She, he seemed to um, enjoy his role as, as her caregiver and just you know genuinely loved her um, for who she was. And she, he would allow her to do as she pleased. She could eat all the forbidden foods that she wanted, um, even despite her restricted diet. Uh, he didn't force her to attend dialysis on a regular basis, so she might go once a week versus three times a week. Um, and there was question about whether or not he understood the ramifications of not attending dialysis as, as she needed to. Um, and then there's also questions if she understands it. But if she didn't want to do it, he didn't force her. Um, well, he died suddenly, and her world was turned upside down, and her daughter, who was minimally involved, um, became her primary caregiver. She, and as you can see from the description, I tried to look at it from a strengths perspective and also um, not such a strengths perspective, um, but trying to look at it objectively. And her daughter can be quite controlling. She actually has a very overbearing personality, and I actually feel rather intimidated by her at times. Um, 
But on the flip side, from a strengths perspective, she is exceptionally devoted and she's an incredible advocate. You know, she goes after something and she gets it. And she actually has, under, under this daughter's care, Miss B's health has improved. Her diabetes is, is now only managed by diet. She's not on insulin. She has lost some weight, which she needed to. Um, and she attends dialysis more frequently than not as, as scheduled. And she is, as well as, she um, moved her from a third floor walk-up apartment to a first floor apartment so that she could attend dialysis more easily as well because they were bumping this patient up and down three flights of stairs in a wheelchair to get her to and from dialysis. So, you know, the daughter really had, um, has a take charge attitude and, and gets things done. Um, however, there's significant discord between the two of them. Their relationship, um, in my observation, is actually pretty strained and quite volatile. Um, just my past visit uh, this past month, um, the daughter relayed to me that her mother had told her, I wish you died instead of my son. You know, talk about a slap in the face. It's like, here I've sacrificed all of these things for you, and this is how you feel about me. On the flip side, the daughter says, well, I'm in control now. So I run the show, and basically, if you don't ship up, shape up, you're going to a nursing home. So it's very contentious. I mean, these two are just, their, their horns are locked, okay? And Miss B really just seems like a prisoner in, in her home, in a sense, um, and, and sort of under this care of her daughter. Albeit, her daughter is trying to do the best that she can and is trying to keep her mom alive for as long as she can. So Miss B begins to experience a functional decline. And she is hospitalized. Next slide, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, Miss B um, enters the hospital twice in the past month. And she has, she's experienced weight loss, significant weight loss. Um, she is more withdrawn than usual, lethargic, sort of sleeping all the time. And, um, you know, we're worried about failure to thrive at this point. And the daughter says to me, I believe my mother's willing herself to die. And then followed up with, but only God can choose when you're going to die. And she's not going to die on my watch. And so, I did sort of have this visceral reaction to that statement. Um, it's just sort of, wow, okay. Um, that tells me where she is in this process. And she is, um, as she said very clearly to me, that they are a family of fighters. But, so they, their value, this, this um, daughter's value is, is that you fight when, when adversity strikes, you fight. And that's how she sort of took the stance with her mom. And, so what, this, what these two hospitalizations did was it sort of opened the door for end-of-life conversation um, and beginning to sort of lay the, the foundation for some of the end-of-life um, questions and discussions, um, such as how does, how does Miss B want to die? Um, is she thinking about that yet? So next slide, please. But with such an overbearing daughter, um, how do we preserve Miss B's autonomy? And how do we elicit from her what her end of life goals are? Um, and these are some of the questions. I don't have answers to these questions today. These are some of my questions as I thought about this presentation, um, about how to approach this case. And um, my goal for Miss B is is absolutely for her to, to die on her terms. And if that means stopping dialysis, um, when she wants to stop dialysis, not when her daughter wants her to stop dialysis. And this, and this is that line um, that is, it's tricky. You know, it's a tightrope right now um, of trying to figure that out. And so how to give Miss B a voice at this point in her life. And I wrote in my notes, you know, Miss B's voice is barely or rarely heard in, these circum in this circumstance. Um, and so as her social worker, what do I do? Well, I listen. I listen to both Miss B and her daughter. I look for opportunities for compromise, to share other 
possibilities of care with her daughter? What, what can we do um, that may be different? And, but that's okay as a difference for Ms. B. I continue to try to engage Ms. B around her goals. Um, you know, one of those times she might actually understand the couple of words that I'm trying to say, and we may be able to have a conversation about her end of life care. I observe the family interactions. And sometimes they get very heated. I had a resident with me over this last, uh, a medical resident with me, and we both walked out of there just going, whoa. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was something between the two of them. And, you know, so what I try to do in those family interactions, the daughter's not going to hear sort of what I think might be a rational explanation at that moment. She's not going to hear that. But what I try to do is, is reflect later on when emotions aren't quite so high and kind of talk about what her feelings are and then also possibly how Miss B might be feeling as well and try to strike a middle ground. Um, and then I empathize. I empathize with the daughter. I empathize with Miss B around um, their roles, the sacrifices they've made, and their commitments to each other. And then finally, I respect where this family is at in their end of life process. If the daughter's telling me she's not ready yet, um, but the mom is, and she hasn't yet told me that she's ready. You know, I follow their lead. And so, you know, it again goes back to walking that path with this family. And so, you know, I, I, we're not quite there at end of life, but we have, um, the door has been opened, so to speak. And so, I'm with the family and trying to walk with them as we uh, approach it. So thank you. Are there any questions about that case or so far? Uh, Adresa? Who's one of our medical residents at the hospital center, third year medical resident uh, on geriatrics right now? Just wait for the mic. One sec. Do you have, there you go. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, prior to um, her decline, did you discuss any of the end of life issues with her and possibly also with the son? Did you ever talk about that? You know, we didn't actually um, because it was sort of status quo and this was the way that they were functioning and, and actually I've been involved with these, this family for four years um, for a long time and it's something that we talk about is trust and this has been a, a difficult it's been difficult for me to build a rapport with this particular family. Um, and I see them once a month, um, every month, over the past four years, and more frequently depending on, on the issues. And sometimes what ends up happening is, is all this other stuff, life, gets in the way of talking about end of life, such as needing to move to a new apartment or getting meals on wheels or getting the transportation to and from dialysis and things like that. And so, you know, you kind of go through this huge um, list of things that you need to do every time and these end of life issues kind of get pushed aside until we're almost in crisis mode. So it's a great question and, and in hindsight, yes, I wish I had. You yeah. know, although I, I guess I would differ. I'm not sure what we would have asked her yeah. or the son, you know, because, you know, if you got hospitalized twice for weight loss and failure to thrive and you were feeling more depressed and you weren't sure you wanted to go to dialysis, what would you want us to do? I mean, that we would have had to ask that question you have the opportunity you know, in that two years ago, which, which I, I don't think we would have known which scenario to paint for her. Um, so what we're struggling with in this case is kind of making the decisions as, as they come up um, because of how unpredictable they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the back. Um, does someone have the power to... Uh, Healthcare proxy decision maker? Did the son have it? I mean, did that question? It's not come written up? down. It's um, but in under DC law, um, the daughter is is the decision maker for her. Can you introduce yourselves, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Kenneth Wallington, Capital Hospice, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the diversity of your team first came up. How diverse is your team? Um, well, diverse, diverse in a lot of ways. Not, not, not. So we have four geriatricians, two of whom are white men and two of whom are white women. If, if you're thinking of ethnic diversity, four nurse practitioners, all of whom are women. Um, 
three social workers, all of whom are women, we ha and we have several support staff who actually are African American. They actually, they, they, we have now instituted a case where our office staff meet the patient first, um, kind of to have it a whole intake. So I, our diversity is mixed, but on the clinician side, um, we tend to be a kind of white, <laughs> you know, up, upper class, you know, up middle class group of people. You mentioned that the son died suddenly. Uh, bereavement. H how did mom, you know, how did that come about? She actively grieved the loss of her son and I think actually is still grieving for him. Obviously, if she's saying, I wish it was you versus my son who died. And would you see the daughter as, as being uh, put upon? I mean, since she was not part of the. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think her daughter is resentful of this role that she's now filling. Um, and, and is experiencing uh, health issues herself as a result of being a primary caregiver and um, being under a ton of stress and not having the opportunity to really um, be able to, to meet her own needs. And that was my last question. Does mm -hmm. she have a life outside she, of her mother? It, a little bit. Um, actually, she's away right now, which is nice. She has been able to take a break. Um, but they're very enmeshed. Um, and she, and she's very devoted. So it's and it's hard um, because she has to be around to assist the transportation company to be able to get her up and down the stairs and, and things like that. She is she is able to work. Um, she got a job after having to quit another job and things like that. So, yeah. But and you know, oftentimes um, I'll suggest caregiver support groups or um, even a health and support group where there's a DC Caregiver Institute trying to connect people. And caregivers oftentimes say, when am I gonna do that? I don't have time now. Um, and almost get angry at that suggestion that they should take on one more um, responsibility, so to speak. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. My name is Stephen Shore. Does the daughter have a family of her own? And if so, have, how has their welfare been affected by the daughter's unexpectedly assuming primary um, health care role for her mother? That's a great question, too. Um, she has adult children. And so they actually have encouraged um, their mom to explore nursing home placement. They feel that it's too stressful. Um, it's not a healthy situation um, emotionally and to, to place her mother. Yes. Hi, my name is Sarah Steck I'm from the Employee Assistance Program at the Department of Commerce. Um, in, in lieu of or in addition to the possibility of a nursing home, have there, has there been any conversation about hospice coming in to be part of the everyday uh, experience there? That was just broached and they're not ready for that yet. It was, um, it, it was, we are not giving up. Think of all the times I could have given up. And so there's a, and basically what we try to do is um, lay the groundwork for being able to have those conversations. And, and we do this from a team approach. And so the physician, the social worker, and the nurse practitioner all make house calls. And so the nurse practitioner went out following the last hospitalization and began that end of life uh, conversation and what I did was I I reiterated that and so what we'll do is is kind of gently bring that up um, as time goes on and Miss B actually perked up recently and so that's the other thing in, in terms of anticipating um, when is when is it when's time for hospice um, and the beauty of hospice is that you can graduate from it as well so um, and we have plenty of, of patients who have done so and it, it, we are waiting for the family to be ready for the hospice support. And they also have, um, they do have personal care aides supporting them as well um, right now. And so, but hospice is absolutely um, part of our plan and, and one of our goals, but we have to wait for the family to be ready to accept it. I just had one other question, which is, is there any other way to communicate with Miss B other than the yelling, shouting at her? I mean, does she... Is there any way to read and write? Is there any way to have like yeah. a very close friend of hers be with her during? Is there, is there any other way to communicate? Yeah, not that we've discovered. Um, she has low vision, um, so that's difficult. I mean, I think what 
what I try to do is, is make the environment the most conducive to clear communication as possible, turning off the TV, getting close, using her good ear, um, she, and she has an audiology appointment. So we're trying from that perspective as well. Any other <clears throat> questions about this case, Adresa? Um, consideration elder abuse, psychological, not necessarily physical? We always assess for abuse, um, abuse and neglect um, going out. And I don't think that, I don't think it's overt abuse. Um, I think that this is how they interact with each other. I think this is a long pattern of um, how this family communicates with each other and sort of the dynamics that are there. Um, this daughter, you know, for all of her rough edges, was right there during the hospitalization. Um, she, and she seems to advocate appropriately um, for her mother in terms of looking at what can I do to better the situation, such as moving to a better apartment and things like that. Um, I think she genuinely cares for her mother. Um, sometimes though and and i think that that's why we're in the situation where we are because she does care for her so much she's not ready to let go for her let go of her um and and that's uh it, it's hard to help someone get ready for that because i think also it's further complicated by the dynamic that's there um between the two of them Oops. There Any other a, questions? Uh, yeah i have one sure. um there was a study done a few years ago in new york and of critically ill patients who were in the hospital, and 30% of them reported that they would rather die than go to a nursing home. So if you hold up the specter of going to a nursing home if she's not compliant, yeah. I think it gets to Adresa's point. At, at what point is that abusive if that's something that this family or this or Ms. B is loath to do? Yeah, well, and I mean, the hard part, though, is, is that without her daughter, she would be in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And so how you know yeah, how, her daughter's how you keeping her out of the nursing home yeah, it, yeah it's the reality i mean there isn't anyone else i mean her daughter's family is saying put her in a nursing home you know and so and this daughter is really trying to make a go of it in the community um and has made a lot of sacrifices mm -hmm. and so i mean what 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 do we do so it's kind of messy yeah. <laughs> rafi rafi um I actually want to, if I'm allowed, to comment on, the, on Eric's uh, presentation just before. Three brief comments um, that um, actually are certain some of the data that, uh, that was brought to, to light here. Um, I, um, uh, when I uh, um, began my study on med medical ethics, um, I was actually brought into um, this issue uh, with a law professor. His name is Ronald Walkin. He's a, a very distinguished figure in, in the field of le, uh, jurisprudence who decided to enter into the field of medical ethics. Um, and unlike him, I was pretty sure that he never s stepped into hospital uh, to do research. He's not a social scientist. He may came there as a patient or to visit a patient, but, but not as a, someone who wants to do a study, serious study. I decided if I would like to um, discuss end-of-life issues and uh, make some recommendations, I actually need to go to hospitals. I need to see the patients, I need to, see, to speak with doctors, I need to have communication with medical staff. So one of the questions that, I, uh, that triggered me is what we are talking about in terms of uh, the population who actually wants to die. How many people actually want to die? That's a triggering issue because there's so much literature about the need for euthanasia, the dignity of the patient, so on. What are you talking about? How, millions of people want to die or what? What, what? what are we talking about? So in each hospital that I, want, that, that I went, and I went to um, very depressing clinics and, uh, you know, ICUs and dementia and cancer and AIDS, uh, terrible sort of situation, it differs from one hospital to another uh, on religious terms. So if I went to Jewish hospital in many countries, including Israel, but not only in Israel, but also outside Israel, I was told by directors of these departments that in the past 20 years or so, he had five patients who explicitly wanted to die. So we're talking about 99% of something. He went to Catholic uh, hospitals, 95 of the patients want to cling to life no matter what. You go to Protestant uh, hospital, 92, 90% will cling to life no matter what. Meaning that in the most atrocious of conditions, 
when people are really, really suffering, tremendously suffering, cancer, cancer is very painful, most patients cling to life, and this, of course, emphasizes what we just heard from Eric. The other issue is the, is the problem with uh, advanced directives. As I told you, I did only one condition, uh, uh, people in, in prolonged unawareness. My research shows, and this research relies on every evidence that I could collect, meaning also from countries I didn't visit myself, like Japan and Scandinavia. My research shows that if a patient who is under 50 years old enter into this condition because of trauma, say accident, or something like that, and not deterioration of the body, he or she needs to have what I call a grace period of two years to recover. Now, this is not the policy in this country. In this policy, in this country, varies from three to six months, not more than that. Now, you see advanced directives forms. One of them, one of the lines, is going to be, I don't want to become a vegetable, or I don't want to live in a persistent vegetative state. Now, of course, this is very simplistic. It's not going to entertain the data that I just collected. And I, you know, I studied only one condition. It's very complicated, whereas advanced, advanced directives tend to be very, very simplistic. And that's the problem. Therefore, as Eric said, there are very, very little use in practice in daily care when you are dealing with real patients. And the third one comment I want to, to make, I had a fierce argument with Ronnie Dworkin. Because for people like Dworkin, autonomy matters, and it matters a great deal. So for him, he says, if a person of sound mind made a provision, advanced directive, living world, whatever, that he or she wants to die when he reaches a state of dementia, then we have to honor the living will. Notwithstanding what the patient says now, because now he's no longer autonomous, he's now demented. I don't care about demented people. In essence, what he says, if a person's lost his autonomy or her autonomy, if he cannot read walking anymore, or can't, or is total, well, he better be off dead, more or less. And I had fierce agreement with, you, with him on this. I dedicated a chapter of my book about you know, what matters. What, what are the best interests of the patient? And I beg to differ. I think that what we have to listen to very, very carefully is what the patient wants now. And even if it's very limited, you know, mentioned the mentioned people, uh, in Dworkin's uh, novel, uh, the, the Life's Dominion, he speaks about patients that all they appreciate in life is uh, jelly uh, uh, sandwiches and, and ice cream. Only even this meager sort of uh, enjoyment of life. Well, I say, if that's what makes them joyful, well, there is. You know, they, they still enjoy life. They don't want to die. And when you speak to people that actually care for patients, even in the Netherlands, that is notorious for having euthanasia, sometimes in an abusive manner and uh, prematurely, you speak with people in nursing homes that are taking care of dementia, dementia people, even their doctors said, you know, demented people can be fundamentally very happy people. So what if they said five years ago, two years ago, uh, or three months ago, they better be dead with, if they have dementia. Now they want to live. And I say respect the people what they want now, knowing in, you know, five years ago, something like that. Hmm. That's, uh, all, I, I agree with all three of those. Um, are we ready for a second case? I have one question, one okay. other question about that case, which is to ask Dr. Pellegrino, you spoke about the importance of planning. And I think we, we heard some discussion about how far in advance one should plan and with what degree of specificity. And I guess my question for you is whether you have thoughts on that, on that component or others with respect to the case of Ms. B. Yes, I do have thoughts, but I'll make them very brief. Uh, the question I wanted to ask here was, let's turn it around away from the patient to you. What is the decision you must make in this case? The decision I must make or the decision I want to make? I'm sorry? The decision I must make or want to make? Well, there's a distinction you're quite right to make that, but which, let's have both. I would love to see Miss B um, enjoy the things in life that she wants, such as when I was there, she screamed out that she wanted pickled pig's feet. And yeah, and that's, that's what she wanted. And her daughter screamed back at her saying, no, you're not gonna have that. So what I came back to the team with was, I said to one of our physicians, I said, can you please talk to her about allowing her pleasure, simple 
food pleasures in moderation. You know, and that what I would like for Miss B is for her to have a voice and for her to have a choice in how she's living well, currently. Then, okay, and it doesn't feel like she You mind that. if I continue this interrogation? I think it's important. Because, yeah, no, it is. Well, uh, what you're seeing is a very different approach to this kind of a case. And so I just want to do that superficially rather than in depth as I would if we were at the bedside. Uh, all right, so you have something you wish for the patient. Now, what do you think the patient wishes? I think the patient wants, um, I think she's voting with her feet in terms of dialysis. She already only goes twice a week and does not, I don't think that she wants to continue dialysis. She doesn't want to continue dialysis. Then. I don't think and she why? Did you ask her? Pardon? Did you ask her that? No. Why? Yeah. Actually, I tried asking, but she can't hear me. And the explanation, when I, I did ask her, why don't you want to go on Saturdays? And she just talked about the nurses. Well, let's take it on, on face value. Right. That you, you believe from your prolonged notice, knowledge of this patient that she really does want to stop dialysis, A. And B, she has capacity to, to make that decision. I don't know if she has the capacity to. She does or doesn't? I don't, I, I don't know. You don't know. I don't know if she has. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that she necessarily understands the ramifications of stopping dialysis. Well, then your next decision seems to me is to make the effort to find that out because everything, from as far as I'm concerned, focuses on whether, in fact, she has the capacity right. to make this decision. Right. I'm not talking about this principle of autonomy. By the way, I don't use the four principle system at all. Mm. Um, so uh, I'm just. Wanting to see what, what's in her best interest. This is what we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think you've presented beautifully a series of important interpersonal relationships. But now, in making a decision, one must cut through that or you mm -hmm. end up endlessly going around a circle. And that's why I'm asking the mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you think that she honestly wants to be off dialysis, but you're not sure that he has the capacity. I presume you've had her seen psychiatrically to determine whether she might have capacity. Do you know any psychiatrists who make house calls? Because we actually have trouble getting some of our patients, so it's hard to get her psychiatric. Well, of course well, that... What we can do is we have two geriatricians who can go to the house and do that. All right, well, whoever. But yeah. uh, I, I won't argue that this conscious has to do it, but has the geriatrician decided with... To determine capacity is not that difficult, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Does the patient understand? patient comprehend what is you want. I mean, I won't go do it. Yeah, but I think the challenge with capacity, though, is, is that um, it sometimes varies. And, yes. and people have capacity at, at times and at other times don't. I, I understand that, but, but, but nonetheless, I, what I see here is a characteristic problem mm. of not being able to decide that a decision has to be made in the presence of uncertainty. I agree with that. But that's what we do all the time in clinical medicine. Mm -hmm. We're making decisions in the face of uncertainty. And what we have to be able to do is to optimize that decision, given the uncertainty, in the interest of the patient. And that's what I'm trying to yeah. ferret out. Well, and I guess the question then, too, is, is when is the time to to sort of make those decisions? I mean, you talked about sort of endlessly going in circles. and. Is that such a bad thing at this point? Well, uh, again, I, I haven't seen the patient. If I saw the patient with you, I could answer yeah. that a little bit better. But it seems to me the process is important. Mm -hmm. And why do you have emphasized, and I agree, I mean, after all, 65 years in medicine, I've encountered all of what you're talking about. And that doesn't make me an expert. But the point is, you still have to find your way out of that right. circle. And uh, it seems to me I would try to determine what her range of capacity is, I have to decide whether it's satisfactory or not. Mm -hmm. If it is satisfactory, then I would allow her to go off dialysis. Why should I say, I don't like to see you go off dialysis? I mean, that's not for me to determine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we tend to intrude ourselves in, in, with, with our value system. Exactly. I'm not saying you're doing that, but that, that's a general mm -hmm. statement. So. In this particular case, no matter what the daughter thinks. Now, the question is, how do you deal with their relationship? 
But first, be clear on where you're going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is, let me argue this point clearly, there is a virtue in an orderly approach to the question. Mm -hmm. Otherwise... And, and we, you know, actually, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think part of the, our struggle with this case is that what kind of capacity does she have for which decisions? Because she can decide she wants pickled pig's feet, but does she have the capacity to decide she doesn't want dialysis? Well, who's going to decide that? Well, you? well, well the, the doctors in our group ultimately will. Well, yes. Well, then, then, then move back to the question. Does she or doesn't she? If she thinks she has, to the best of your ability right. to do so, we're limited, we're not perfect, then I, if you think she has it, I would let her have it. If not, I would not. I would try to persuade her not to. And the daughter's intrusion in this, of course, has to be handled carefully, mm -hmm. but it must not intrude on the mother's. There's something you didn't mention. There's a tendency to infantilize the older person. Mm -hmm. By the way, I happen to be 88 years old, so I'm in the category of people that you're talking about. Uh, there's a tendency to infantilize and to say, you all should do so and so and so and so, mm -hmm. as if we were back in our childhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, Well, anyway, I'm not lecturing. Uh, the only point is, that to answer your lot. question, I could not answer without having gone through an orderly process of knowing where we were, yeah. what it is we wanted to do and had to decide what you would like to decide, and what you must decide being two different things. Mm. Okay. Yes. You got, you got the mic there. I'm Yen Zhou from Mark University, Washington College of Law. Yeah. I'm very interested in healthcare law, uh, especially in this case. I noticed that in this case and uh, another speakers, you talk about the benefits, risks, and costs. In this case, uh, without uh, patients uh, around, uh, per perhaps uh, patients don't want to die. How how can or who can decide this case, and uh, how can the decisions make? And do the, in these cases, uh, does the uh, decisions must uh, lead? Set up, uh, set up model such as uh, just like the economic analysis method. Yeah, okay. If I understand the question, is how, how would we make decisions y taking in the economics into consideration yeah. in her case? Of course, I, I think that uh, in this, this case, it uh, includes some facts such as uh, uh, ethics, uh, social issues, yeah. and the family values, and uh, patients' uh, wellness. Yeah. How can we decide that? Yeah, so the best reason. So what we, and, and we'll, as we kind of finish out the presentation, what we've come to on that question is that we do not really take into consideration the costs and economics of the care of our patients because <laughs> in geriatrics often, and this is just co coincidence, I think, what's best for the patient often in geriatrics is less expensive. The hospital is a dangerous place. It's very dangerous for frail elders to go to the hospital. It so happens that we think home care with a lot of portable services is safer for them than the hospital. So what we find is going, working through the process of having a trusting, long-term relationship with the patient, you know, um, I actually end up thinking it may end up being less costly to society, but that's not why we're doing it. Um, we just focus on our relationship with the patient over time. Um, being clear about m mental capacity. And I completely agree with the, what's been said up from the panel that you have to know if the patient has mental capacity. And then uh, what we're talking about is as these decisions come up over time, you have to match mental capacity with decision. You know, which decisions do they have capacity for and which decisions do they don't. And one of the hardest things I have when I do a mental capacity note and I have to tell the court of DC this patient lacks mental capacity or they have mental, usually you know if I'm going to court it's to say they lack mental capacity. I get nervous because there's a whole lot of decisions that patient might be able to make but the ones that we're going to court for are stopping dialysis or, or, or something like that I don't think they have capacity for and it's a very gray area and that's kind of the, uh, some sense, the essence of our of our presentation. That this, these are gray areas. Mental capacity, I think, is one. So I think that uh, um, if uh, false or true facts, why is the benefit for the patient, and then why is the benefit for the hospital or the healthcare system? 
who, which one is the best important? As your doctor. Well, as, as the primary doctor, I don't think about what's best for the hospital. I mean, a lot of doctors in our country um, make decisions based on what is financially profitable for their practice or for their hospital. Um, and in our practice, we have a focus very much on kind of mission of doing the right thing compassionately. And so we focus on what we think is best for the patient. But oftentimes, as this case illustrates, the caregiver who may be in conflict with what you think is best is also the person who that patient is relying on for their daily life 24-7. So you don't want to alienate that daily caregiver or create more conflict um, that could be counterproductive. So we're, we're, we're walking the line. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, why don't we go to the second case? Because I do want to just flip through this. It offers some other very interesting kind of medical decision-making questions, not so much psychosocial capacity stuff. So this is case number two. So the reason this is such a busy slide is because this was a really sick patient. This is an 85-year-old woman who had at least 10 illnesses, who I met about uh, nine years ago now on a house call. She had moderate to severe dementia due to both alcohol, chronic severe alcohol use in her past, and vascular events. She had frequent falls, pelvic and orbital fractures over the years that I knew her, hypertension, renal failure, was on dialysis since 2001, poor vision with severe cataracts, hard of hearing, had a blood clot in her leg, had inflammatory arthritis requiring steroids, which led to weight loss and muscle wasting and skin breakdown, prolapse urethra with bleeding, fecal impactions due to her narcotics. Fecal impactions, for those of you who don't notice, is kind of what it sounds like. Um, your colon becomes impacted with stool and you get belly pain and you can't move your bowels. Generalized weakness, weight loss, and all of that managed um, extraordinarily by a devoted daughter who I will call Rose, um, who quit her work about eight years ago to care for mom. Next slide. So six years go by. In July 2005, she has a m kind of functional and mental decline, uh, unable to walk anymore. Her daughter actually would <laughs> walk her on the daughter's feet. You know how you used to do with kids? You kind of walk them on your feet. So she would walk mom on her feet to the bathroom to help her get to the commode, uh, also used the wheelchair. The daughter called and said, uh, Mom has kept her eyes closed for five days, but is still eating every time I bring food to her mouth, but kind of shutting down, right? She's nonverbal now, totally dependent on her daughter, who renovated the whole first floor suite, suite of her home um, get to provide 24-7 care with handicapped bathroom, just extraordinary kind of physical renovations to take care of mom. No written directives from the patient, which is usually the rule for me. Um, most of my patients have no written directives. Um, daughter is the legal power of attorney by DC law. I'm always in some ways relieved when there's a single child, an only child, because then you don't have to negotiate the different children's kind of different wishes. And in DC, all children have the same authority and rights if there's no written power of attorney. So a couple months later, we get a call uh, in September 2005 that mom stopped breathing. This is uh, the daughter had done CPR, called 911. The patient went to another hospital in the city other than ours. Daughter calls us from the emergency room um, and says, I'll pay whatever it costs to transfer her to your hospital because because of the long-term you know, trusting relationship, I, I believe, that she had with us because we knew her, we knew her mom, we knew um, both medically and psychologically what they really, what really they cared about. She was transferred to our hospital. She was unresponsive. She was breathing fast. Her respiratory rate was 45. I saw her in the emergency room. Her heart rate was 100. Her blood pressure was okay. But labs and uh, clinical exam all suggested she had both respiratory, brain, renal, and mental and musculoskeletal failure. Not brain death, but all of those organ systems were in um, advanced stages of failure. Right, so I went outside the ER to talk with the daughter and said, uh, Mom, I think her mom is dying. Based on a clinical judgment and when that was going to happen, I wasn't sure. But I, I think sometimes... Um, I have found it very important to be very frank with families so that they kind of understand what the situation is. Um, but we can't predict, um, and I, I, do, I do that very rarely because it's so hard to predict when someone is about to die. But I, So I said that, and so we started talking about, okay, what are our goals for her care? Next slide. So the first thing the daughter said, which was the most um, kind of, 
powerful thing that she says. She said, I just don't want to feel guilty about how we're taking care of her. So whatever we do, I don't want to feel guilty. So that was kind of the daughter's wishes. So we talked about life support machines. I thought the patient probably needed to go on a respirator in the emergency room and initially say, yes, I think we should put her on life support because if we don't, I might feel guilty. Um, I didn't know what the patient wanted because the patient was unable to communicate and actually had been for the last several years. We have some more discussion because in looking at her, my medical judgment was that I thought that would not be a futile intervention, but I did not think she would successfully get off life support, but I said we can do that if, if, if that's what you think your mom would want. She said, but also, make sure you keep her comfortable no matter what. I go, okay, well, <laughs> those are sometimes opposed. So to, to put someone on a respirator and in the ICU, is you can keep people comfortable, but it's, those are sometimes opposing values clinically. She said, and I don't want them to put those big central lines in her neck in the ICU, which is almost uh, de rigueur, a, a, a requirement when you go into the ICU. She didn't want to have that you know, CPR pounding on her mom's chest. And ultimately, she decided, well, if, if, we, if she needs to have central lines or would need to be, you know, have a lot of those invasive procedures in the ICU, let's not do the uh, respirator and CPR, but I want full nutrition, dialysis, full medical support, everything else possibly done to have mom survive. And her final quote was, let's just take it day by day. So we kind of came to agreement on what the plan was. So next, next slide. So four weeks. And 28 conversations later, so that would be one for each day, um, the patient is not dead yet, as I predicted. Um, she's off oxygen, still breathing fast. She's now hypotensive. Her heart is kind of giving out. She's hypotensive and unresponsive mentally, bedbound on NG tube feedings because we put a feeding tube in so that we could support her nutritionally because she was too unresponsive to eat. Remember in July, she kept her eyes closed for five days, but she ate three meals a day. She was, but this time she's lost that ability. And I think clinically she's still imminently dying, but I'm not sure when. Um, she's not able to tolerate dialysis because of her blood pressure being too low and the dialysis could precipitate a cardiac arrest. So she's in a highly <laughs> gray zone. So her daughter's response is, okay, well, I'll take her home and I'll just drive her to dialysis. You know, and... and the, staff, the nursing staff, and so I've been trying to coach the nursing staff not to, you know, tell the daughter she's being unrealistic, not to kind of get into, you know, debates with her about the medical situation, but the staff would say to me, oh, I think the daughter's unrealistic. She made her aspirate because she tried to feed her mom when mom was unresponsive. Aspirate is when the food goes down the wrong pipe. She's having, quote, a hysterical fantasy about what, you know, she's gonna, her mom's going to survive this. Um, but we, we tried to protect the daughter from those kinds of um, uh, criticisms and say, okay. And she was very, we, we talked every day. She knew exactly how sick her mom was, and she didn't want to kind of put the central invasive procedures on her, and yet she was still hypotensive and dying. So we decided to send her home without hospice because daughter felt that hospice would really symbolize giving up and not doing everything possible until the last day. So I felt like I was walking the line. I was, I was going to walk this line every day with this family, and if, and if whatever kind of we could agree on as a common team for her patient, for the patient, we would do. Um, I, I did tell her I thought mom was actively dying, but she still planned to drive her to dialysis in her Volvo. Uh, five days later, the patient stopped breathing at home. Daughter did uh, sat quietly for about fifteen minutes, and then called us. She didn't call 911, and she said, Mom is gone. Um, we got a follow-up note from the daughter a month or so later. Um, she had actually been in healthcare field for 21 years, and she wrote a note, which uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase, is that in my 21 years in the healthcare service, I've never felt the kind of compassion and patience that your team showed for me. Many other people I ran into in the hospital and healthcare gave up on me and gave up on my mom, but you did not. Um, and the, this case was hard for me because I, I felt like, wow, you know, we're using, you know, up all this time and effort, and I think she's going to die anyway. But you know, I don't want to abandon the this, the daughter. But I think the patient, I don't know what the patient would have wanted, so I'm not going to be able to ask her. And we kind of walked the line all the way, and then we ultimately had a peaceful death at home. 
Um, so I felt like in that sense it was a success. The daughter did, did not feel abandoned and she did not feel guilty. Now, if she had said, I don't want to feel guilty and she had made me kind of suffer, make her mom suffer and do ungodly things to her mom despite medical, best medical judgment, then I would have had to draw a line. I wouldn't have gone with the daughter that, that far down the line, but we did. Um, and so ultimately that was a very really, um, profoundly kind of rewarding case. I'm gonna, I, we have a couple, a couple f final conclusions that we want to go to, but let, let's go to the next slide. So this is the questions that came up from the case, and maybe we can ask, talk about this case a little bit. The uncertainty in this case was absolutely um, kind of uh, blinding to me. You know, when does gravely ill become dying? It's this mis mystery still to me. When does gravely ill become dying? So how do you talk about it? At what moment do you, do you, do you, do you discuss which decisions? How do you balance the interests of the patient, um, who in this case is not able to speak for herself, and of the family, which often are emotional, sometimes financial, financial both ways. Sometimes they want the patient to stay alive because they are living in the person's house or they're living on the pension. Sometimes their interests are the other way financially. Um, or spiritual um, interests. What is success? You know, what is success for this patient? You know, f I, for me, it was that we didn't cause you know ungodly kind of pain and suffering, or or do things to her that I would feel were just. Uh, we use this terrible term in medicine called re rearranging deck chairs. You know, where if you really are convinced the ship is going down, the person is dying. Um, you don't want to just do a lot of rearranging the doctors. You want to be honest and say, mom is, is, is dying. Um, but for me, success ultimately was what happened, is that the daughter felt supported by the team. The daughter felt she did her, her best for her mom, took mom home, and the patient had a peaceful event with her daughter um, when she died. Um, I don't know if that's success, how you all would define it, but it ultimately felt successful. But it was hard. It was, it was a lot of hard time getting there. Um, and finally, I think we'd like to close with a couple slides about when is it painful and when does it go well? And that's going to be a little bit from, our, from a general perspective. We want to speak a little bit about when it's painful for the doctors. So, you know, we're, we're speaking mostly to a non-physician audience, I imagine. And I just want to kind of have you hear the perspective from the social worker and the, and the doc about when does it seem to go well and when does it, when is it can be very painful and hard. So I'm going to talk a little bit about when we fail, but don't actually go back to one slide if you could. Are there any questions about the case? Because it, it, it generates generate a lot of questions for our team. I wonder if anyone here has questions. Is this on? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm with the Alzheimer's Association, and, and the, I like the way you all have talked about the capacity issues and the complications of someone having dementia. In this case, she went on a, she went home with a feeding tube, or no? She went home with her NG feeding tube, yeah. And that wasn't considered uh, painful to the patient or invasive? Because there's a lot of controversy about Yeah, um, you know, once she put an NG tube in, um, and, I, and I think she, I actually, was worried about her ability to be sensate and feel pain. I did not feel like she was actually feeling much pain at all, but I don't know for sure. Once the NG tube was in, I did not feel like it was causing her a lot of discomfort. She was essentially quadriplegic. She was unresponsive, almost in a coma state. So at that time, I felt that the burden of that was um, minimal. In the back. an interested citizen. If this woman had had an advanced directive, at what point would you have acceded to her wishes? All right, so advanced directive in the sense, so there's two major parts of an advanced directive, at least for me. One is written specific instructions. I don't want a respirator if I'm terminally ill or if I have, you know, two doctors have said that I'm terminally ill. The other is the medical power of attorney. I want Mrs. X to make decisions for me if I'm incapacitated. So um, this, the latter part is in some ways the easier part. You know, she was clearly incapacitated very early on in my knowing her three to four years ago. And so at that point, her daughter, who was her power of attorney, 
by DC law, I didn't need it to be written down, was automatically the decision maker. And I thought she was both morally and legally the valid. I don't know how, um, so to answer your question, if she had written advanced directive saying, I didn't want a feeding tube, um, this is where advanced directives for me fall apart. Well, I don't want a feeding tube permanently, or I don't want a little temporary feeding tube to see if I can recover from my pneumonia. I think the only time I would have really let advanced directives kick in is if I was convinced that she was dying imminently and she didn't want dialysis, you know, respirator, CPR. If she had said that, and I knew she was imminently dying. But again, doctors are pretty poor at knowing when someone's imminently dying. Um, so advanced directives don't, on that side, the, the specific instructions don't kick in for, for me much at all. Um, uh, the power of attorney and decision making is the one that I really rely on. Because um, those decisions that come up are unpredictable, changing, illogical, not illogical, but the, the number of variables in a clinical decision are so great, depending on whether they're in the CCU or that they're at home or whether they're in the nursing home, you, you might make different decisions. So I don't find advanced directives to be able to anticipate those things. Yes? Do I assume correctly that the daughter did not drive her? to dialysis once she took her home the last five days? Yeah, she, she did not drive her to dialysis in the Volvo. She, she felt that mom was too weak and her, we saw her at home in a house call. We, when we, our, we sent our patients home and this gets into what we think really makes it work for us is we continue our, our care for the patient in the hospital at home and we went and saw her at home, her blood pressure was too low and we talked with her about how that she couldn't survive dialysis or the trip to the dialysis and she was okay with that. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you think might have happened to this patient had she been admitted to a hospital without the kind of team and foreknowledge that you had yeah. of her? for so many years. Yeah, thank you for that question. That, that's, that's just a beautiful question because my impression, ma'am, is that she would have gotten uh, put on a life support machine, respirator, potentially in the emergency room, and would have had a highly prolonged time in the ICU where the daughter would have been struggling to deal with strangers who don't know her and her mom. And we, we, it, 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 she probably would have, I suspect, died in the hospital rather than at home because we wouldn't have been able to avoid that, um, that um, you know, very invasive therapy that in her case I think would, would not have made a difference. But because without the trust and the, without, this was a case where my trust with the, with the daughter after five years, we probably made 150 house calls to her house over the last six years between the nurse practitioner who are a key part of our team and myself. So I probably made 30 or 40 of those, the nurse practitioner probably made 100 of those, and so that trust carried us through. Yes, sir? Does spirituality playing a part with, it, with the last patient and this patient? Um, you know, for, for the, the last patient, I can, I can say that during my time that I knew her, she wasn't uh, involved in a church or spiritually involved. Um, the, the daughter um, and her, her, she was actually newly engaged, the daughter, newly married as well. She had a new, a new marriage she was dealing with at the time. I, I never heard her speak too much about spirituality as a driver. It was much more the emotional attachment. Her mom actually had, um, um, she, with the way the daughter described it, had kind of a, um, been emotionally abusive and had left her, her daughter at times when she, the daughter was younger, and she did not want to do that to her mom. So that was a very poignant um, response that she was trying to um, sometimes assuage her mom's sins, for lack of a better word, by making sure she treated her mom in a different way. And in the other case, absolutely, spirituality plays a plays a role. Um, the caregiver has said that she uses spirituality and her faith as a coping mechanism. You mean they're, they're, they're able to come and bring their pastor or or a chaplain to help them in their decision making? Not in decision making. But um, just in terms of um, gathering strength, so to speak. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right there. I'm wondering if you could just talk briefly on how you determine the goals for care and how you can 
determine that the surrogate is acting in the best interest for the patient? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's lots of different types of goals. I mean, the ones we deal with are much more kind of some of the things Jenna mentioned with the, the, the is this pa what does this patient want to have in their daily life? So that's kind of the first goal. Where do they want to live? Um, what do they want to eat? What are kind of their daily goals? Um, and then when someone's mortally ill or gravely ill in the hospital, then we start talking about, okay, well, um, <clears throat> what are the goals in terms of medical goals? And, you know, and those are, you know, is it life, is every day precious, every minute of life precious? And if that's what matters to you and that's your goal, okay, well, then we'll do that. You know, so one is kind of how they perceive length of life versus their experience of life, what they want to go, to, go through. The medical goals are, you know, can we fix this problem? So that's kind of, are there reversible diseases that we can treat with, whether it's antibiotics or the respirator or the feeding tube? So I see kind of the, the daily life experience goals. What does that patient want? Um, then kind of how do they, what's their value system about life and how do they want to be, you know, live their life? And then the third is kind of just the medical goals. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of blocking and tackling of being a doctor. And that's the easiest part, actually. Um, kind of knowing the, the emotional and spiritual structure of the patient and their family <clears throat> um, and kind of negotiating like this first case talked about, you know, how do you get the patient their simple daily pleasures of life, their, their good care, Good daily loving care, you know, is, is probably my number one goal. Um, how do I get 24-7 daily loving care? That's, you know, what generally is the family's goal as well. So there's kind of the daily goals, and then there's the value system, and then try to negotiate the medical decisions around those two. Best interest. Um, how do you know if someone's acting in the best interest? Um, and the first case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I try to look at the case as a whole um, and try to have a sense of what's motivating the caregiver um, around the decisions that he or she is making. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I go into it with thinking that this person is acting in the best interest. And as um, the situation erodes or if there's sort of flags that present themselves, um, then, you know, I, I delve deeper and, and try to assess actually what's going on. Um, and it, it, it varies from case to case. Um, but you always, you know, it's a constant assessment. Your assessment's always going on um, around this. And I think that also um, caregivers change from acting in the best interest for the patient to sometimes acting in the best interest for themselves and, and trying to understand um, w why is that changing or um, what is motivating that person and why. Um, I want to just mention, is there any other questions before we go on? So we're going to just close by saying kind of w when we feel like we fail and then when we feel like it goes well. You know, when we feel like we fail is when our values kind of step in and trump the patients. And I would add to that when I feel like a family's values are trumping the patients. And that's, that's hard because um, oftentimes things are not run down or the situation is unpredictable. And if you, I have a gut feeling that this isn't what my patient would have wanted, but the patient can't speak to me anymore and the family's stepping in and trumping, um, I often feel like it, I, I, I have failed or the situation is, is, is really painful. If we're authoritative or rigid, meaning we think we know what's best or we kind of have a value system that your values don't seem to comport with. Um, this gets to the earlier question, when we are strangers without a trusting relationship. Um, and fortunately, we don't have that experience much because we have long-term relationships. But I think that's when modern medicine fails, is when uh, elders are cared for in hospitals or, or by a team of many different specialists, each of whom takes an organ of the body or are strangers to the patient and the family. That's when I, that's, if I had to solve one problem, that would be the problem I would want to solve, that, that patients uh, are cared for, elders in our case, are cared for by uh, primary care teams who they trust and they, who they know over time. And I think that's a very, um, r unfortunately, rare event in, me in American medicine right now. Um, you know, uh, when we're unable to listen or understand, like I was saying, we go to one house or one f bed in the hospital, we have to understand one patient's value system, and the next time I'm going to see a guy who has 
you know, bladder cancer is an 88 year old guy who had bladder cancer that wasn't making him die. But he was ready to die. He said, you know, okay, why isn't this thing killing me faster? I, I want to, you know, can't you do something for me? Can't you give me something? You know, he had the Hemlock Society book, and he, 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 he was ready to go. And so we kind of have to figure out, well, how do we, how do we take care of you? We're not going to do that. How do we care for you when your, mo your values are completely different from the other person that I just, you know, came out of a room down the hall with? But we have to be able to listen and understand to all those kinds of, of feelings. Um, when it is painful, and I guess this is you know what I highlight is how often this is an emotional, um, irrational kind of process for for us anyway. At least we run into these feelings. Is when the family and the patient and or the patient are in you know really bad denial. Not just you know I don't want to think about something bad, but ultimately you can kind of get through. But when patients and families are in such denial that you can't even talk in in a kind of a reasonable way about what's happening, um, being shot as the messenger. Um, that's experience I, I have had, not commonly, but when it happens, it's very painful. You know, you bring, you're bringing bad news, bad outcomes occur, and the family either find, or the patient, usually his family, try to find some reason to be angry at you or hostile towards you. Um, that's very painful. And partly why I think a lot of medical students don't go into geriatrics, frankly, is because if you're just responsible for the kidney or just the heart, you know that's pretty neat and simple, and you can you, you don't take responsibility for the whole patient. Taking responsibility for the whole patient can be uh, a more a much more emotionally challenging event. Um, or when the patient the family is hostile, I mentioned that, or even scary. You know, we uh, most of our patients are really extraordinarily wonderful families. Um, but whether you're on, no matter where you live, or but families can get angry to the point where you feel hostility, and then you have to decide: Can I stay in this relationship with the patient? who is not mad at me, is not hostile towards me, but I want to have a caregiver that is. That's, that's very hard, because then we feel like we may have to abandon the patient because of family's behavior. Or when the family uh, insists on an inv invasive therapy that we believe the per patient would not have wanted, but the patient can no longer speak for themselves. And then you're stuck between either following you know, a family's wishes or doing something that you feel um, the patient might not have wanted. Um, when it goes well, and we're going to, um, you know, we have a long-term trusting relationship with the patient. I mentioned when we value the family as experts. When all else fails, I kind of fall back on asking the family or the patient. But um, I apologize for using the family so much. But we often deal with a very high proportion of patients with dementia. So over the half of our patients, we end up having the family serve as decision makers, but perceiving them as treating them as experts, in person, and sitting down. You know, one of the main therapeutic maneuvers we do in our family meetings is we do it in person, not on the phone, and we sit down instead of stand up. And it's remarkable how when you sit down, you're actually conveying a respect, a willingness to listen, I'm not in a hurry, um, that you're, you actually genuinely want to hear what they have to say. Um, daily communication, ne next slide. Um, if it's 28 conversations over a four-week difficult hospital stay, you, you, you do it. Um, and that ends up often preventing much more difficult times down the road, which I think is something that Dr. Pellegrino mentioned. The time you, you put into having the, that communication saves actually a lot of time down the road. Having an awareness of the experience of the patient and their loved ones, um, and listen carefully, <laughs> um, and understanding there's a lot of uncertainty. And then finally, you give all the options, you know, which we did outside the emergency room with this patient. We could go to the ICU and do a respirator and CPR, or we could do full support in kind of a more intensive unit, but not do the respirator, and give some permission to forego invasive treatment if that's consistent with the values of the patient. Next slide. So fi finally, skills for clinicians that we try to teach our students and residents and that we actually learn every day is to try to build trust. Um, that may take days or years, and then what Jenna told me the other day, that may never happen. You may never feel like you can have the family or the patient trust you, no matter how many, how much, and, and, though, and so what do you do? Do you, stay, do you keep hanging in there and, 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 um, until the very end? Well, usually that's what we try to do. You maintain an alliance with the patient and the family, because you never know what's going to happen. I wanna, you never know what situation is going to arise. Maybe the family's right. Maybe this last ditch effort is going to work. So if you, if, you, if you don't have an alliance, it's very hard to function. You guide with compassion and intelligence. 
Um, we talked about the uncertainty and help give you know, recommendations during uncertainty and then have the courage to see patients and families through the, what's called, this Mr. Perk, Dr. Perkins calls the fearsome experience of dying. It's, it's a scary time. Um, and so you just have to have some courage to get through that. Uh, for the families, and I'm going to just take this opportunity to um, um, ask uh, families to kind of think about doing these things that make it go well, which is to ask for and demand honest answers. Find a responsible doc, someone who's in charge, and ask for and demand honest answers. Um, specify a power of attorney who knows and respects the patient's values. Um, someone who you feel has kind of their interests at heart and also the pa who the patient hopefully has identified as such. Creating a system of daily loving care, whether that's in the hospital or at home. And then help them emotionally prepare for the death of, the, of a loved one. Um, just to kind of make sure that they understand the situation their loved one is in and that if there's any emotional support they can have uh, both before and after the death uh, to offer that. So I'm going to close a summary. Next su summary slide. I, I put this up er early in the talk, but this is in some sense our summary, that there is deep clinical uncertainty about what's going to happen and there's inability to anticipate things. There's very strong emotions that come up with family dynamics and there's a wide range of values, all of which are legitimate. You know, the values of one family, the clinician's values, and the values of another family. And understand that moral hazard is going to kick in, meaning that's, you know, the appearance of the bull changes when you get into the ring, that you're, you, might be, you're, you might change your mind about being quadriplegic on a respirator. When you're alive, you're quadriplegic, and you're on a respirator. That might seem like a pretty good life, whereas 10 years ago, you thought, I would never want to live um, quadriplegic on a respirator. But when they ask quadriplegics on a respirator, how is life? 75% of them say good to excellent. So, so the, the, the moral decisions that people make will change. So a static you know, piece of paper that was written two or three years ago is very hard to rely on. So what we rely on is the trust and alliance with the family over, and the patient over time. Um, and if we didn't have that, I think we would, um, it would, it would, right now I find it very rewarding and satisfying most of the time to uh, you know, help be on this journey, help patients on this journey. Um, but that trust is, is what really allows me to feel that way. And if you'll tolerate, I'm going to actually quote Johnny Cash to close the talk. Because this, this line from Johnny Cash actually for patients, families, and doctors and clinicians I think really captures what this, this journey is about. It says to keep a close watch on this heart of mine, meaning what, what are your feelings and what are, how are you contributing to this dynamic? I keep my eyes wide open all the time, you know, you know making sure you kind of see all the issues that are coming at you, both medical and emotional. And then I keep the ends out for the tie that binds, meaning that alliance with the family and the patient um, and making sure you kind of uh, maintain that at, at all costs. Um, and then the last line is because you're mine, I walk the line, meaning we take real pride in our relationship with our patients and because we care about them so much, we're willing to walk the line with patients. But I think family and caregivers often feel the same way. You know, this is my loved one and I'm willing to walk you know, the line as I think the, both of our caregivers we've talked about today did. Um, and with that, I'll close and ask if there's any other questions, um, and thanks for your attention. Do we have some more time? Um, yeah, why don't we take a couple more questions, and um, I, I actually have one too, so go ahead, for, for any of our panelists. Elizabeth Aiken, I'm from Gross Point, Michigan. I've worked in the critical care arena for many, many years, and I have a medical uh, show that's starting, but I have another show that I'm ending that's been mostly medical lately. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of interviews with a lot of physicians, and I do a lot of work with intensive care patients, critical care patients. I just have to say a couple of things. First of all, this is not a closed unit. I can tell that you work in or that you're dealing in where the in a closed intensive care unit.